Let's now consider what's possible, both for individuals and through our relationship with people that work for us, what's possible for our employees. Because one of the underlying themes, I think, from the first two hours we spent together is the hopelessness of the situation. We have many, many people in dire financial straits, and it's be only been getting worse over time, and prospects don't look good, particularly in this, this state. So is there any reason to be hopeful? I believe there is. And if so, what are the steps that can take us out of the position we're in today towards financial freedom? Now, I met Frank and Denise Hart about two and a half years ago. I became aware of them. And it was because of the beginning of their journey. Now, let me tell you what they were facing two and a half years ago. They are not low-paid people. Between them, they were earning $200,000, which is a nice family income. And one of the reasons I, I choose to tell their story is we tend to say that you know, if you're earning $50,000 a year, you may have financial issues. But the truth is the more you earn, the more attractive you become to credit card companies and mortgage companies and car lease companies. And so ironically, the higher your income, the lower the percentage of your income that is disposable or freed up because we've got so many obligations financially. So on $200,000 a year, you might say they had many reasons to smile. And in fact, they were known for being one of the happiest couples in their family and their group of people. But what people didn't know about them was the secret they were holding and the shame that was attached to it. If I told you that between the two of them, they had four or five credit cards and about $8,000 in debt on that, would you agree with me that they were facing some material financial issues? Well, probably not so much. The truth is they had 45 credit cards between the two of them and $83,000 of credit card debt in addition to a mortgage, no savings for retirement, no savings for their kids' education, of which they had three in their teenage years, two or three years away from college, and they were paralyzed. They were paralyzed because, A, they weren't speaking about the issue to each other, and so both of them felt like it wasn't something I could bring up and therefore something we can deal with as a family. So each month they would go through the same cycle of not quite making ends meet, finding another credit card. So many of their credit cards didn't even have a signature and weren't activated. They were there for the sole purpose of taking money off one onto another to hold it temporarily and then move it the next month. And that's why they had this batch of 45 credit cards. About two and a half years ago, they listened to a radio show together. And on the radio show, the person was talking about financial freedom and how to get out of it and what you can do about it. And as a result of listening to that, they bought the book. And each night, they would read a chapter each other, to each other in bed. So Frank would read a chapter, and then Denise would read one the next night. And the first thing that happened to them is they started to see that there is a possibility to escape financial debt. But it requires a different approach than most people think. And what they noticed was missing for them wasn't the IQ or the skills to be financially free. It was the mindset. The mindset that they held was one of overwhelm and being paralyzed and being ashamed and wanting the whole world to think that they were financially free and well off and not being prepared to or able to speak to friends and family about it. In this book, they learned about the steps that you go through and counterintuitively, the first step that was asked of them was not pay off your credit card debt or save for retirement or anything else. It was just put a thousand bucks into a short-term savings account. And you may have heard that. I heard somebody mentioning Dave Ramsey. It was his radio show, the largest private syndicated show in the country. And his recommendation is put aside some money just a little bit. Well, a thousand bucks is not just a little bit. But in the face of mounting credit card debt and no savings for retirement, it seems like an odd choice. Until you start to see what people are really facing that leaves them financially unfit. You see, being financially unfit is not so much a question of your income, it's a question of your behavior and your habits. You can become financially free earning $50,000 or $30,000 a year. Admittedly, below a certain level, it's almost impossible. But for most people earning minimum wage plus a bit in this country, financial freedom is a possibility if you're very careful with how you plan and spend your money. And that's where the challenge lies in our behavior, not so much in our income. There are many, many people that are earning as a family three, four, five hundred thousand dollars who are in overwhelming debt. 
And you would think that income would have allowed them to deal with that. But how many of you, by a show of hands, have experienced that each year when you get an increase, if you do one, do get one, you feel like finally I'm going to be able to pay off my debt and buy these things, and two months later you just feel like you're even more in the trap than you were before. Yes? Okay. So they started on this first thing, and they did find a way to put a thousand bucks aside. Their choice was to sell a couple of things, frankly a bunch of garbage they were planning to get rid of, or let's call it one person's garbage is another person's treasure, so they had a garage sale and got rid of it. And within about 45 days, they had put a thousand bucks aside. And as a consequence of that, started to feel just a little glimmer of hope that something was possible. The second step that they was recommended to them was now that you've got this little savings kitty to deal with the short-term emergencies that come up, let's start getting clear about stopping the bleeding. And they went to work on building, and importantly, of course, sticking to a budget. Because there's that old saying, which is, it doesn't matter how much you make, what matters is how much of what you make you get to keep. And that's all a function of how well you stick to your budget. And they started to notice the many areas in which they were living a life larger than their income afforded. The number of times they ate out, the entertainment and vacations they went on. And so they, they made a deliberate choice to trade in short-term pleasure for financial freedom. And we're starting to make good progress on that. Two and a half months in, Frank was diagnosed with liver cancer. And now you can imagine, as you heard from Sabra, the kinds of bills. They did have health insurance, but in that next three or four months, they were facing about a $30,000 out-of-pocket set of payments. Now, fast forward two years later, Frank and Denise have done some remarkable things in their financial life. Not only did they weather the storm of a cancer bout, and thankfully, Frank is now free of cancer, they funded that $30,000, and in two and a half years, they have completely canceled or paid off $83,000 in credit card debt. They have now started to fund for their kids' um, education. For the first time, they're putting money towards retirement. And interestingly, they became the couple that their cousins came to, finally saying, you know, we are defeated. We're in such overwhelming debt, we don't know where else to turn to and we need a loan. And for that, them, that was the point in their life when they realized, you know, we really now are financially free because although we may have been approached two years ago because we looked like we were doing okay, if someone had asked us for a loan, we would have had to say no because we were drowning in debt ourselves. When I last spoke to them, they had shredded up their 45 credit cards and made a piece of art out of it. They put one of these vision boards on, on all the things they wanted to do with the money they now were saving. So instead of going on vacation in lieu of saving, they were putting money aside in order to have the things that would be afforded by saving. And two and a half years ago, they had a 20-year mortgage. They're now on track and they monitor everything. They put up this little chart in their living room. They're now on track to pay off their 20-year mortgage in four years. Now that's a remarkable story, but it's remarkable only because it's unusual. And most people don't have that spectacular kind of turnaround. Again, let me repeat, on $200,000 gross income, so net of tax, that's, that's around 120 or so, in two years they paid off $80,000 in credit card debt, another $20,000, 20 to 30 in medical bills, and have been putting money towards retirement and kids' education. So if that's possible for this couple, Arguably, something perhaps less spectacular is possible for all of us and for our employees. So how do we help everyone, and especially our lowest paid employees, to get themselves out of these debt cycles and to do the kinds of things that are, in a sense, so obvious to do, but yet we find them so difficult? Here's what's interesting about financial fitness. It's unlike other areas of wellness, because there's so much debate about which diet is better to lose weight and to be healthy. And it changes every year. That's not true in financial fitness. You know, the steps are always pretty obvious. It's not through a lack of knowledge that most of us are in financial, financially challenged positions. It's because the habits of getting there are hard to practice. We're surrounded by companies offering us new and interesting gadgets and leasing plans and 
uh, other opportunities for having a life bigger than what we really can afford. And that's why it's so difficult. So here's the first step, and it's probably one that your leadership is going to ignore, but I say it every time anyway, which is step zero, pay lower income earners more. And of course the response is, well, we don't have the money, we can't do that. But it is worth reflecting that in this country we have the highest disparity between CEO pay and the average pay for most employees. Last year, a company in Seattle, CEO, got really clear about the impact that this was having, and he's one of the first leaders who have said, from this point onwards, everyone in my company gets paid the same salary, including me. Now, I'm not suggesting your CEO is gonna give up their salary and do that, but it is true to say that for many people, the wage that they're being paid is simply not one that makes it easy to be financially fit. So let's put that aside, and let's look at perhaps what's more realistic other than an increase in pay. Step zero might be, as we heard in Frank and Denise's story, helping people to build the confidence that they can get out of these holes of debt. And counterintuitively, it doesn't start with paying off the debt, which is what financial planners would tell you. Instead, it starts with doing something that's easy to achieve in 30 to 60 days, which is putting aside some kind of short-term savings net. Remember we heard earlier that more than half of Americans can't afford a $400 surprise bill? And the consequence of that is feeling fragile around your finances. And this is a way to take some of that frag fragile feeling away and to start to build confidence towards that. So the first step is to encourage your employees, even while they have debt, to sell some stuff, to sacrifice something for the next month, to do whatever it takes in the next 30, 60, or 90 days to just have that money aside as evidence to themselves that they can make progress. Now, in order to do that, they're going to have to make some choices. And so the second step is connected to this, which is stop the bleeding. Stop accruing more debt. Start getting further into the hole. And the way to do that is to set and stick a budget. And that might be you know, using this booklet that a couple of you have won. It might be using tools like mint.com or the many other ones. It might be as simple as looking what you spend each month, or rather looking at how much you have coming in each month, and turning it into cash and putting it into envelopes or putting it into jars. It makes it very visible how much you've got, and when that envelope for new shoes is spent, well, you don't buy more shoes. It is a very interesting thing to notice how we relate to spending money when we're using cash versus credit. By a show of hands, how many of you have ever been out to a restaurant or went to a Starbucks and the bill came and you signed it and you walked out of there and you didn't know how much it was? Has that ever happened to you? Okay. It happens very often because it's just so easy and in fact that's why credit cards were invented, for the convenience and ease of paying things quickly. But the price we pay is we lose touch with how quickly we're spending money. So the third thing we can do is then look to reduce monthly expenses and how do we do that? Well, the best way to do it is to pay off debt because one of the most difficult to deal with monthly expenses is the interest on the stuff we owe. And we're not even getting anything for it other than just not sinking. But there is an interesting recommendation from Dave Ramsey and others on how you should pay off debt. And the answer that he's come up with is rooted in the psychology again of confidence over the economic ideals of efficiency. Let me explain what I mean. If you ask an accountant or a financial advisor, what should I do with my mountain of debt? I've got eight different credit cards, I have a lease and I've got a mortgage. They would say, well, you want to minimize the amount of interest you pay. Therefore, rank your debts from the highest interest to the lowest and pay off the one with the highest interest first and then move on to the next one and the next one. Makes sense, yes? The recommendation for psychological confidence is to do something different, which is to rank your debts from those that are smallest in outstanding balance, regardless of interest rate, to those that are largest, and to pay off the smallest one first. Why? Because you feel something when you pay it off, that sense of victory and accomplishment. Even though you may be paying a little bit more interest in the end, the difference is people who use this debt snowball succeed and do end up paying off their debt. People who follow financial advisors' best laid plans, which is start with the biggest interest rates often never even pay off that first debt because it's so overwhelming. 
So pay off your small debts, then pick the next one, and pick the next one, and pick the next one, and you start to get into the swing of things. And with confidence comes competence at paying off debt. With competence comes more confidence. And that's why it's called a debt snowball. We get into the swing of things. And sooner rather than later, you'll find of those 45 credit cards that you had, you're down to 40, and then 30, and then 20, and then some reasonable number. And finally, as you saw with Frank and Denise, they have no credit cards today. They've cut up every single one. Step four is to build a buffer. Because even though you may start with a short-term savings plan, $1,000 is not enough to deal with a medical emergency or something a little bit more catastrophic than I need to call the plumber or I need to fix my car. And so once you've stopped the bleeding, you have a budget in place, you've paid off or are paying off your debts successfully, the next step is to save a little more than for just one month's catastrophe and to aim for what most advisors would say is a sufficient short-term emergency fund, six months' worth of salary. You saw in the beginning of today's presentation that the vast majority of people don't have one month's cover. If they were to lose their job, they couldn't survive for the next 30 days. Having six months' worth of salary gives you that kind of sense of comfort that in the worst case, and particularly perhaps in this state, if I was to lose my job, I've got a month or two or three before I'm in real trouble. Step five is to protect what you have because now that you're not paying debt and you're starting to put a little bit of savings away, you really have to protect yourself from the big things that can happen in life that could make all of that effort for nothing. And how do you do that? You consider and buy the right kind of insurances. Health insurance that protects you from medical catastrophes, disability or long-term care, or life insurance, or homeowners, or car insurance, the kinds of things where you pay a small monthly premium, or not so small in this state, in return for the security that if something catastrophic happens, your family is protected. Now again, many financial advisors would say you should start with that, or certainly many insurance brokers would say you should buy the insurance first. But what sense does that make if you don't have that much to protect in the first place? So protection makes sense when you're on the path to financial freedom. The sixth step is now to start considering saving for the future. And here's an interesting thing uh, about, in particular, Dave Ramsey's approach, but other psychological approaches, is they say, and we believe this wholeheartedly at Habits at Work, you can't change more than one habit at a time. And in the area of financial fitness, you can't attend to multiple areas of your financial life at a time. So while you're paying off debt, Counterintuitively, the recommendation is not to put money towards a retirement fund. Now, for how many in this room, by a show of hands, does that sound like advice that makes you cringe a little? Yeah? Because we've spent so many years trying to encourage people to put money into a 401k. But here's the thing. So many people never get there because they swamped by debt. And so it's better to have a plan that people will stick to because it's psychologically intelligent than the perfect plan that no one attends to because it's difficult for people. And so even if the expense or the cost of doing so to pay off your debt is reducing 401k funding for a while, it's a smart thing to do if in the end you attend to everything. But in the order of things, preparing for your future makes sense, of course, and you know the vehicles that are there for that, 401ks, or if you're in education or other um, entities, 403bs, and a range of private investments. And here's the question. Is it worth it for an employer to get involved in a conversation with employees that is difficult and fractious and something that they probably will not welcome you in having? Is it worth it for an employer to spend time and money educating people about financial fitness and these different pathways to freedom versus saying, your money is your own business. We recommend you get a financial advisor and a tax advisor, but we're out. Our job ends when we pay you a salary and we offer you benefits. What, we, what you do with it is none of our business. Well, if you look at just a recent case study and not a particularly effortful uh, engagement with employees, just two hours per week for 12 weeks in financial literacy education. So the kinds of things I've been talking about, these simple six or seven step processes had a significant impact in return in a whole bunch of areas that we were speaking about earlier. Lower turnover, lower presenteeism, reduced absenteeism, and improved overall performance. 
as ranked by or as reported by the people involved in the study. Now my team at Habits at Work, we have a research lab called BRAT Lab, the Behavioral Research Applied Technology Lab. We've been studying for about the last five years the relationship between people's financial habits and their financial health, and then between their financial health and their work performance. And the next graph I'm going to share with you is the summary of all of that really in one simple picture, which says, if you are an employer and you're concerned about productivity as you should be, and you want to understand the relationship between financial security and productivity, here's what's so today. The vast majority of employees are stressed by or stressed about their financial insecurity, despite the generosity or otherwise of your pay and benefits because it's not how much you get paid, it's how much of what you paid you get to keep that matters. It's a behavioral, not an income issue. And here's the opportunity to move people just to the right, to on the path to financial freedom, or ultimately to that feeling like, I have enough. I have enough to make ends meet. I have enough to protect my family. I have the right kind of insurances in place that I can deal with whatever comes at me. And I have enough or I'm on the path to having enough for retirement. So that for the last 10 years, I can focus on what I want to do in life and the accomplishments I want to make for my employer instead of spending an increasingly large amount of time worrying about retiring, extending my retirement, or starting to have conversations with my kids about who's going to look after me.